and soil sampling, nutrient analysis, and assessment. Um, <clears throat> nutrient sampling, analysis, and assessment. Basic components of any analysis program. Soils, organic wastes, and plant tissues. That's basically what we can test. Is there anything I missed in that list? Anything else that anyone's ever sent off to be tested? Irrigation water, I guess, could go into that component. Uh, waste waters, things like that would go under organic waste. Then, <clears throat> interpreting the results and developing the recommendations and practical applications of that soil plant organic waste testing. So these are the kind of things I'm going to cover today. So in the analysis program, for any of those things that we're going to have analyzed, we've got four basic components. Sample collection, representative sample collection, laboratory analysis, interpretation of the results, and nutrient application recommendations. Okay? Um, I guess here in Maryland, uh, pre predominantly rely on the University of Maryland recommendations. Uh, so a lot of this stuff comes from lookup tables. So really, I think, in the field, sample submission and collection is probably the most important critical uh, component, I think, for many of your uh, points of view, because that's the foundation of everything else, of all the fertilizer recommendations that follow. The soil sample collecting is of the utmost importance. A lot of times people will come to me and say, you know, I've got this, this result, this soil test, I have this recommendation, and it's crazy, it's way out of league. And the first question I always ask is, how much confidence do you have in the sample? Especially with PSNTs. I get it. A lot of questions because people don't trust the PSNT value. I've dealt with several of those in the past couple of weeks. People saying, here's, here's my result. And I say, well, who collected the sample? How was it collected? Because the rest of it is pretty standardized. So <clears throat> don't use brass, bronze, or galvanized tool. A soil probe is uh, the best tool. So right here is a soil probe, right? They're typically made out of stainless steel. So they're not going to contribute anything to the sample. Uh, you want to have a clean bucket. This may seem kind of like a no-brainer, but it's not always the case. And then, typically, most labs supply a sample bag or box, okay, that you would use to submit that that sample. Um, uh, interesting story from my uh, own lab. We had a study. Oh, which study it was? I just remember the end result. Uh, I don't know who collected the samples for us or anything, but we had a bunch of samples come through the lab, and, and my technician that runs all the samples, because we can run full sample analysis, he says, you know, here in Maryland, so my technician's from Oklahoma, he's kind of getting familiar with soils and stuff, and he's a really good soil chemist. He says, you guys have got some jacked up zinc here. He's like, you, you, in Maryland, we might have an issue with uh, zinc toxicity in crops, so I think we really need to look into this and maybe do a study on it. So we followed the sample back. And as it turns out, the person who collected the sample used a galvanized tool. Contributed a tremendous amount of zinc to the sample. So don't use a galvanized shovel, but it'll give you really funky results. Um, <clears throat> management unit. So before you collect the sample, you have to know where you're going to collect the sample from. And a management unit is defined as an area with similar uh, complex of soils, uh, similar management. So, you know, if you have a field that's all the same soil type, but it's been split as far as crop rotation, so it's been in beans one year and corn the next, and, and so you have both parts of that rotation there at one time, uh, that shouldn't be one management unit, or even though it's the same soil type. And generally, over the long term, it's had the same fertility applications. Those fertility applications weren't at the same time, and so climate didn't interact with that management decision at the same time. So it should be split into separate management areas. Um, there's not really any limit on acreage. I mean, if you have a huge uniform field that's been managed the same, you can count that as one management unit for general purposes. Can more than one field be a management unit? Uh, yes, in a less than perfect world, uh, if a group of fields is managed the same, which we see on, on uh, you know, with the smaller field sizes, in other words, everything's been done basically the same, and they're the same soil unit, then they can. Um, you know, the more similar they are, the better off you are doing that of aggregating fields to cut down the cost. But really, for the cost of analysis, and you're getting ready to make one of the largest, fertilizer is rapidly becoming the largest cost of any grain production system. It's getting ready to pass seeds and herbicides and pesticides if it hasn't already. Um, and for the cost of a soil sample, which is the foundation of that whole decision, 
I would say I would look very carefully at trying to manage it as finely as possible. If there are mobile fields in a management unit, you should collect soils from all of those fields. Uh, you don't walk onto a field, you know, if you've got 200 acres, this one management unit, and just collect all the samples in the same spot. Okay? You're going to cover that whole area. You want to cover all the fields, no matter how small that field is when you sample it. Um, and, you know, the nutrient recommendation is no better than that soil sample. Something else that there's been a lot of recent research on. People always ask me, how many soil samples? Uh, I'm not a good one to answer that question, but the technician I was telling you about, he did some of his PhD work on answering that question, how many soil samples. And actually, the most important part is a lot of people will just run across the field and take a sample like this, zigzagging across the whole field, as we'll discuss later. But really what you should be doing is at each spot in that zigzag as you move across the field, you should take about five or six samples at that spot. So if you're taking a dozen seems to be a magic number for the plot size we use. So if you're doing a dozen pours within uh, an area or sample locations within an area, each sample location, take a couple of those pours and put them in your bucket. A lot more work, but you would be surprised. A guy out in Colorado did a big study on uh, uh, looking at uh, results for the same field from different nutrient, uh, from different uh, fertility consultants that have been doing the soil sampling and the wide range of phosphorus recommendations that came from different consultants. And then he sampled it himself. And he went through and sampled with one sample at each spot, two, four, up to 12, and found that there was a wide, wide variation in what the fertilizer, end fertilizer recommendation would be, depending on how many cores were taken at each sample location in that random pattern across the field. Um, avoid unusual areas. You're fertilizing towards the average of the field, so don't think, well, I'm going to go for this really good area. I'm going to go for this really bad area. You want to look at the average field. Of course, you want to scrape away that residue because uh, you want to get the soil in your sample. So, like, if it's a no-till field, there's a lot of residue. Uh, 15 to 20 locations per management unit. You're sampling to the plow layer. Eight inches in Maryland is the basis of our recommendation. Um, but there are other applications, like if you're looking at surface pH, if you're looking at sulfur, although I'll tell you that the soil test for sulfur is really pathetic, so I wouldn't even waste my time. But we do recommend taking two depths, and that can help you, because deep sulfur can be very important, so we recommend two depths for sulfur sampling. PSNT has to be a 12-inch sample. Um, so we do a random sampling pattern to account for natural variability. And this comes from what? I know Trish talked about this earlier. Parent material. There we go. <laughs> Not the same parent. Soil formation processes occur with that parent material. And also man-made variability. So uneven application, especially we see this a lot with manure, right? Or spreader overlap, or you have a heavy deposition right on the outside edge of that center of that manure spreader or something like that. And you can walk in a zigzag pattern to get that randomness, you know, just zigzag across the field and take about, you know, a dozen or so, 20 samples. Grid sampling. This gained a lot of popularity a while ago, kind of went down in popularity, and now I hear a lot of talking, I think it's coming back up, um, where you take a grid and pose it on the field. Uh, maybe each of these grids is 300 foot on a side, and take five to 10 cores in a circle around each one of these intersecting points within the field, and that way you cover the whole field. It's a pretty intensive way of sampling. Um, you may want to sample known variability, right? If you think you have a nutrient deficiency problem, a lot of people will go out about this time when they're getting ready to side dress their crop, and, and if they look for problems, and they may want to correct it with a, a fertilizer application. Um, the way to do that would be to sample in the bad area and the good area, because if I only sample in the bad area, I have a lot of people do this. They'll sample just in the bad area, show me the soil test, and say, what's wrong with this corn? And I can't tell them anything unless I see a sample from the good corn, too, because it might not have anything to do with soil nutrients. It might be a pest problem, uh, disease, something like that. Whereas if you have a sample from the good and a sample from the bad, and we see the manganese is really different, and they were taken right next to each other, you may have a manganese deficiency problem. I love using the term. How many people have seen Caddyshack? I'm going to steal that video and put it in all of my talks. Because do you remember the part where he's like, manganese? You're talking about manganese? I love manganese. I love manganese. I, I love, I'm standing here talking to you. You think I'm talking about soil, thinking about soil fertility, but I'm really thinking about Caddyshack while I'm talking. Manganese. But anyways, um, so 
You can sample the known variability. You can discard that in some of your sampling when you're taking your average sample. Um, you know, uh, you, if you can manage it separately, but if not, I would disregard it. For example, I've been in a lot of fields that are close to say where there was a, uh, a dairy barn, right? Back in the old days, we used to spread the manure right out the back of the barn, get rid of it, and so you'll have a really high nutrient situation here. And if you include that in your overall soil sample, you're going to underfertilize the rest of your field. So if you know that's there, disregard it. Wet spot can be the same thing. In a wet spot, uh, would you expect your potassium to be really elevated or really low? Kind of depends on the drainage, but if it's an area that's going to drain out, it might be very low. You can see a lot of things like that. You may see a lot of mineralization in that area. <coughs> uh, again, I said use a clean bath, plastic bucket. So I, I sometimes I think, uh, did anyone notice I speak fast sometimes? Anybody not notice that? I was talking to a homeowner's group about soil fertility. So I thought, well, I'm going to go into this really basic, right? Because they've never taken a soil sample. They've never even heard of a soil sample. So I'm going to come in, I'm going to come at this at the very most basic level. And I got all done, and a guy raised his hand. He says, how many soil cores should I take? And I said, well, you know, we talk about this, you know, probably area size, about 20, 20 samples or so. He says, I just can't afford that at $9 a sample. <laughs> no, no, no. You've got to mix it in a bucket first. So take your 20 cores. Put your bucket, mix it up, and take one subsample. So I want to make sure I get that across. Clear, we're talking about mixing this in a bucket and taking one sample for analysis of those 20, 20 uh, cores. And it's about one pint, normally, is what those boxes or bags are. Um, if you dry it yourself, never put it in an oven. You lay it out as thin as possible, say, on a torn open brown grocery bag, you know, or on brown paper, and let it air dry. Don't ever try and heat it in an oven to dry it, because you'll change the, the chemical composition of the soil. And again, this information is very important because that's what they're going to base all their recommendations on. So if the soil is really damp, I don't recommend taking soil samples when it's really wet, but sometimes you can't get around it. I mean, I've got, you know, I've been out and taking soils where I was up to my knees in water. It was just last year, the field was never not underwater, you know. So, but the, the important thing is to get it as dry as fast as possible if it's pretty wet soil. A lot of the big labs now process samples really quick. So just normal field moisture is usually all right. Um, open pasture, some, some unique issues. If you want to avoid uh, these areas where there's lots of manure piled up or devoid of vegetation, because they're going to be those problem areas, something that's different. Uh, you want to sample from forest production areas and avoid these, uh, these bad areas uh, if you're sampling a pasture for, for fertilizer. If area is not a pasture, must the soil be correct? And the answer is no. Uh, soil tests are not required for holding lots, sacrifice areas, these high use areas uh, where, they are where the animals are kept, unless you intend to apply fertilizer. But I would hope if you have a bare area, a high use area, you're not planning on fertilizing the soil where there's no grass growing. Now, if you plan on trying to revegetate it, then yes, you have to take a soil sample. Um, <clears throat> so the second step, you've got the sample, is chemical analysis. Um, there's a lot of different procedures and extractants that are used, very different. And being we don't have a, a University of Maryland uh, soil lab. Now, I think some people here are not. Is everyone here from Maryland? That's people from out of state. No one here from Maryland? Out of state, few out of state people. What states? Jersey. Pennsylvania, all right. Yeah, they got pretty good soil testing labs. Rutgers lab's still open, right? And uh, Penn State and Wolf runs a solid lab up there, so. Uh, Delaware's got a good lab. But, so now most Maryland people, you've got to go to a private lab or to one of these other universities, and, and everyone kind of runs different methods and different extracts. So you want to know what method to run on your soils. And I found out that on commercial samples, it's not listed on a lot of the sample now. So most people's experience, I didn't know that before. I thought I always listed what the method was. But as it turns out, like ANL doesn't list what method they use. Do they? OK. I've seen somewhere it wasn't listed. So. Uh, on mine, it was always listed. So it surprised me when I saw one, but it wasn't. And different procedures, as you might have guessed, will have definitely different results, because it's completely different chemistry. Uh, a lot of people look at uh, soil extraction like this, right, as uh, available nutrients and unavailable nutrients, right? Not correct at all. If this is all the phosphorus in the soil, test C is going to slice off a little piece of it. Test B might get all of slice C and for more, and then slice A, you know, method A would slice off that whole chunk, all right? 
So the way it's going to be interpreted, it's going to be very different. And then you can even have a sample that gets a little bit of both, but not that whole chunk. So there's a lot of ways to look at kind of graphically how a soil extraction works. But it's not total. It's an estimation of plant available nutrients. It's not even really plant available nutrients. But as we talked about previously with phosphorus and potassium, plants can take up inorganic soluble phosphorus or potassium only, right? Um, it's dissolved from clay minerals, dissolved uh, from primary and secondary minerals, mineralized from organic pea. Um, but total soil phosphorus is 99% unavailable. Um, you know, 30 to 70% of this could be organic forms and 30 to 70% inorganic forms. And any given soil test is going to take a little piece of each of those. You know, I mean, 99% are available, but the malic free test is going to take a little chunk out of each one of those. Uh, I think we beat the soil uh, phosphorus uh, thing to death there, so we can move on. Um, so here's an example of that, of the different kind of a pie representation, representation of total uh, soil P. You've got this big chunk of organic P, which can be 50 to 75 percent of the soil phosphorus. And then you've got aluminum phosphorus, iron phosphates, um, you know, clay held phosphates, and then that little bitty tiny piece, 1 percent uh, solution P. And um, different extractants can grab different pieces out of here. Uh, for example, the malic 3 test is pretty good at getting some organic P, better than uh, uh, the malic 1 was, which was previously used. And so the soil test is calibrated to the specific location where you collected your soil from and for that test. You estimate the, the nutrient supply capacity, not really measure it. Um, so here's a couple, couple uh, different extractions. Water-soluble P, uh, it's not typically used as an agronomic test, but you just take water and soil and shake it and then filter it and analyze how much phosphorus is in the water in the filtrate, right? Gray phosphorus, um, you take the same thing, you take the chemistry, you mix it up with the bray, shake it for only five minutes, extract it. That's a pretty popular one around here. You might see it, uh, I'd say, next to malic free. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's popular nonetheless. And then malic 3 phosphorus, and here's all the chemistry there. You know, it's a much stronger, uh, strong acid with EDTA that frees the phosphorus up from the metal, so it's getting a pretty large pool of phosphorus, and you're going to shake for 15 minutes and filter. Um, so here's a comparison of those three for the same uh, uh, soil. Uh, malic 3 would extract 30 parts per million or milligrams per kilogram of uh, phosphorus from that soil. Uh, the exact same soil, Bray, would only get 15, about half, and modified Morgan would get a tenth of what Malik 3 would get. Okay? So there's, there's a huge difference in what uh, soil tests can extract. Um, so the, you know, basically they go through and they extract it and they come up with uh, the concentration, the filtered extract, one part per million phosphorus or one milligram of phosphorus per liter of extracting solution. That's what that means, okay? So they do this in the lab. Then they multiply it by one kilogram of phosphorus per uh, million milligrams of P. Um, and, you know, do the conversion from kilograms to pounds. And then do, they had a 25 milliliters of extraction solution. They used 2.5 cubic centimeters of soil. So you multiply it by that ratio and then times one liter of extraction solution. They go through all these conversions, and this is the final answer, what they come up with. But they might report it in different, uh, they may report it somewhere down here. So, you know, 40 pounds of P205 per acre. Um, they might give it to you in PPM in the soil. They might give it to you in milligrams per kilogram. But Maryland uses uh, FIVs. Um, some co common uh, conversions that you should probably know that may show up on some soil tests, although most commercial labs don't do it this way. But to convert from pounds of potassium to pounds of K2O, you use 1.2 multiplied by 1.2, reverse it to go the other way. And then pounds of phosphorus to go to pounds of P2O5, which is the way we're used to dealing with fertilizer numbers, uh, you multiply by 2.29. So to get to potash, you go by 1.2. And to get from uh, to phosphate, you use 2.29. Um, what are some of the reasons? We covered this a little bit for soil tests. 
Uh, you could have different extractions, Malik 1, Malik 3, Olson, Morgan, Modified Morgan. I hope they're not using these because they don't convert well to uh, University of Maryland recommendations. Uh, they could use different units. They could use pounds per acre of a given nutrient. They could use milligrams per kilogram or PPM. Uh, they could do a different basis of expression. Again, potassium versus potash. What do you multiply it by to go from potassium to potash? One I just showed you, that would be 1.29. Original uh, uh, Maryland uh, recommendations are given on the basis of fertilizer equivalents. So uh, originally we went with uh, pounds of P205 and uh, pounds of potash. So <clears throat> back when they decided to close down the, the University of Maryland lab, they did a, a lab exchange. And this is the result. I get a lot of uh, phone calls and emails about this too, and I always tell them to call Joe. So, and then Joe tells them to call me. So it goes back and forth, back and forth. And um, <clears throat> it, I, I, it took me a few years, but I figured out how government works. That's, that's government. It's the highest, most efficient process. Um, so uh, they took a lot of samples, 665, uh, and they did basically they wanted to take the old University of Maryland recommendations and calibrate them to all the labs in the area. So these were just the labs that were big then. There are more labs now. There's a lab opening this summer over in Delaware. So, you know, I mean, this stuff is changing rapidly. And what I say to people when they call me, they go, hey, look, I'm going to use this lab. It's not on the approved list from the state of Maryland. I say, University of Maryland doesn't recommend or track from any lab. There is no approved list. These are conversions for that lab for the method they use at the time. And as a matter of fact, I think some of these labs may have changed some of their methods by now on a few of these nutrients. These were just the conversions for that extraction. That's why we presented how the extraction was put forth. And so if you really want to know what conversion to use to get back to Maryland FIB, so that you can figure out how much fertilizer to apply, you've got to know the extraction method that your lab employs. So at the time, a &L was using 20 milliliters of malic free solution and 1.7 cubic centimeters. So they're using a scoop method, not a way method. Most commercial labs do because it's faster, of soil. So regardless of what your lab's name is, if that was the extraction ratio they were using and that was the solution they were using, you could use the equation we have published for that to convert to Maryland FIV. Uh, Agri-analysis did the same. Also, you've got to pay attention. I didn't put on this table uh, the basis of expression. Brookside, uh, the same. Penn State uses 25 mils and 2.13 cubic centimeters. So the solution's the same. But the amount, the volume of, of, of soil and the volume of, of extracting solution were different than the other ones. Spectrum used much less solution because they're trying to be tight. Um, University of Delaware is the same as Penn State. Um, the University of Maryland was still on Malik 1. Okay? So completely different chemistry there. Um, so if, if your lab's not on this list, you need to find out what method they use and just pick out from the methods on the list. Um, so these are the labs that were listed, A&L, Agri-Analysis, Brookside, Penn State, Spectrum, University of Delaware, and Waters. And I know there are more labs now. Uh, Dairy One out of New York's moving down into this area. Some people send their samples out to A&L, Ohio, um, stuff like that. So here's the document, SFM4. It's available on, uh, on Trisha's website for uh, converting between different soil testing labs, SFM4. Um, basically, it's an easy calculation. I think the worksheet's right on there. So let's say I used waters, and the reported analysis for phosphorus was 67. Uh, you take basically the values out of the columns on that table and fill in the blanks, 1.18. Column A on SFM4, Table 2. 4 is the value in Column B, and you come up with in Maryland FIV, so a reported value of 67 from Waters, the FIV of 83 uh, from Maryland FIV. Now, <coughs> a lot of the labs report Maryland FIV on, is it required that they, it's not required, but some of them report Maryland, uh, uh, Maryland FIV to make it easier for you when you're doing a nutrient management plan. But, I'll be honest, the first time I looked at one, it's hard to find. It's, it's hidden on there. They don't put it right out front. There's like three numbers in the column, and one's the Maryland FIV. Um, okay, so now you've collected your soil, the lab's extracted it, presented the results, you've made sure that it's in FIV, okay, and you go 
<clears throat> to the University of Maryland recommendations, here's what's behind those recommendations or different, if you go to different people for recommendations, which, you know, you shouldn't uh, in Maryland, but you may, so I want to make sure you understand how the, the philosophy is behind this. Um, one is fertilize the soil. And there's two ways to do that, build up and maintenance. So you build up the soil test to the optimum level, and then for maintenance, you just re replace crop removal. Okay, so you've got low soil test P, and if you're using the philosophy of build up and maintenance, you add a bunch of phosphorus as quickly as you can to get it up in the optimum range, and then every year you just add enough phosphorus in the starter to replace what was removed through the crop. And then fertilize the crop, which is the sufficiency level uh, concept. I'll go through these. So a maintenance or build up, a maintenance and build up program is, rap, is, is identified by rapid increase to optimum or high, um, and then annual application of nutrients. Um, it's based on conservation of the soil's nutrient supply capacity, and uh, maintenance plans for application of nutrients regardless of the soil test level. So at that point, once you build up, this says you don't have to soil test as often because you're just going to apply crop removal no matter what your soil test is, and you're just going to hopefully balance it out. We know from the nutrient cycles we were over before, this isn't entirely true because you continually, like with potassium, have exchange going on between the soil CEC and the soil solution. So it's not an entirely accurate way to manage your nutrients. And so with this approach, it would recommend uh, soil testing every three years just to check to make sure something drastic hasn't changed in the system. It disregards that buffering capacity from the soil CEC, okay? Uh, and nutrient cycling, you know, that there are losses from the system. It's not crop removal isn't the only loss pathway, but all you're doing is accounting for crop removal when you apply that rate each year, year in, year out. And so you have uh, potential for over-fertilization during the maintenance phase and potentially uh, economically and environmentally wasteful during this phase as well, okay? Uh, the other thing is, too, is the soil buffer capacity not only works during drawdown, the soil buffer capacity uh, works during buildup. You could over-fertilize or under-fertilize during the buildup phase by not having, you know, soil, soil testing going on regularly because different soils' buffering capacity is very different in their ability. Uh, you know, 10 pounds of phosphorus added to a clay soil is not even going to budge the malic 3 soil test. The 10 pounds added to a sandy soil will really change it because the buffer capacity of that sandy soil is lower. All right, <clears throat> fertilize the crop, a sufficiency approach. Apply enough nutrients to provide for optimal response. That's, that's the functional difference here at a given soil test level. So here's what my soil test is, above which am I going to have a response or not to adding fertilizer. So I'm not really worried about crop removal or whatever. I just know that at this soil test, I'm going to have a response if I add fertilizer, or I'm not going to have a response. If I'm up over 100 FIV, I'm not going to have a, a yield response to that fertilizer. So you've got to know what the critical level, above which there's not going to be a yield response, so that's a key component. And then you only apply fertilizer when the soil test is below that critical level. If the soil test is below the critical level, the fertilizer rate recommendation is based on crop response calibration. So we went out and found a bunch of low soil test P sites and put out a bunch of different rates of phosphorus. And at a given uh, soil test, say a, a malic 3 of 20, we saw which rate was where that yield response curve peaked out, right? So does everyone understand that? So we've got rates, we've got, you know, we've got yield, and the point where yield leveled out, we didn't have any more response from that fertilizer uh, uh, application. Um, but this requires, if you're going to do this every year, we require annual soil testing. Here's this uh, curve. So there's the soil test phosphorus and FIV. The critical level is 50 on the Maryland FIV scale. Above that, chances are phosphorus won't get you any yield response. If this was for uh, uh, potassium, above that, potassium fertilizer is not going to get you a yield response. Down here is very likely that you're going to get a yield response by adding fertilizer phosphorus. And again, with the sufficiency approach, you're going to add enough phosphorus to get that maximum yield response. You're not actually trying to build up the soil to get it to the optimum. Your soil may always stay in the medium. You might have to apply a phosphorus fertilizer year in and year out to get that yield response. 
Um, most calibration studies are long term. We still have uh, some long term calibration studies going on. Um, it tends to be conserved in that you use less fertilizer uh, at the higher soil test uh, levels. And again, it's not applicable for nitrogen because of all the mobility issues and so forth with nitrogen. But I'd say in general what we use is a mixture of these approaches. Uh, you know, people try and tend to build up their soil P, but that's a difficult thing to do if you're down that low or medium range. It's actually very difficult to build it up. Manure is actually the fastest way to do it. Um, there's some variability in the soil test calibration. In other words, a &L's recommendations are different than University of Maryland's recommendations. So, you know, you can't use their fertilizer recommendations if you're in Maryland because it'll be very different from what the university recommendations are. Uh, most people don't sample year in and year out, so that's why we have this maintenance component of how much fertilizer to apply in between years of soil tests. Um, but with regular soil testing, testing, as, as it turns out, both both philosophies come out pretty close. Cation saturation ratio, Trish touched on this. Uh, from Trish's tone of voice when she spoke about it, what did most of you think about it? Did anyone get a, 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 an indication of how it's viewed within the scientific community? There's like, there's a couple people, there's like, there's actually this one guy, what's his name? He's like 200 years old. No, he's like from down south somewhere. He travels around and gives talks about this all over. Yeah. He, he, People bring him in and pay him big bucks. I should start hawking this stuff because he gets paid to travel all over the country. And he's the only person I know who really, really sells this. And you know, it's based on this ideal ratio. Um, I, I don't think it's very valid. It's uh, calibrated, calibrated only for specific soil types. So you have to have it calibrate for your soil type. Um, and sometimes the recommendations are crazy. Uh, but some people like it because it's simple and easy. You know, there's just this ratio, this magic ratio, and then you try and build up to it. Moving on to manure. Um, <clears throat> sampling manure is critically critical, and it is challenging. Probably, maybe depending on the type of manure, maybe it's challenging in sampling soil because manure can be more variable, more heterogeneous than the soil. Uh, but you know, your application rate is based on this analysis, um, and you got to have a representative sample. Uh, to have a have a reliable analysis and require a reliable recommendation. This is very important so that you, you know, end up with the right amount of nutrients out there. Um, so most manure is going to be stacked in a pile like this of some sort. You want to take 10 to 15 samples and the nutrient content really varies with depth in this pile. Um, so you want to take it at different places and if you're using liquid you really you want to agitate it before you collect your sample. Uh, the easiest time is during loading, but typically that's going to be too late unless you know how much you're going to put out and then you're going to come in and supply the rest of your nutrients later, um, which we don't recommend in Maryland, but you know, that's actually you know, during loading. So if you're spreading out of a poultry house, you've got to get your samples before you spread. You know, if you're cleaning out a house and applying it out the back door. Um, so you want to get it from the stockpile before you apply, maybe when you're moving into the stockpile or something like that. During spreading is a great time because you're getting realistic samples. Um, and you know you want your sample to include whatever's in the pile or in whatever you're going to spread is what you want your sample to represent. Uh, you want to mix that sample very very well. It's more difficult to mix manure than it is soil, right? Um, break it up, mix it up really good, and then take your sub sample and package it up and ship it off. Uh, typically, they recommend using a, a Ziploc bag just so that you're not stinking up the mail. I don't even—is it even legal to ship manure? I've, it is legal. I, I, I've never asked. I mean, I've shipped a lot of it. I shipped like several tons to Arkansas once in, in uh, Rubbermaid totes. I came in with the first box. And it was all like completely hermetically sealed in duct tape. The guy was like, you want to ship that? I was like, yeah. And I came back in like 50 more times with totes. You know, it was like 45 pounds per tote. We sent like four tons. But uh, yeah, I guess you can use a plastic bottle or jar, not glass, obviously. So you don't want it to break. Uh, whatever your lab recommends. Uh, liquid manure, agitate it. Minimum of five samples is best. Again, it's variable too. Um, field application is the best time, and then you can figure out how much nitrogen come in a side dress. Uh, if, if you're going to apply wastewater only, uh, then again, you don't want to agitate because you don't want the solids up there. You want to sample what you're going to be applying. Semi-solid manure, avoid the crust. This goes with uh, poultry litter too, dry manure even, because the crust is going to be very, very different and it makes up a small fraction of the total volume of manure you're, you're spreading in that surface area. 
doesn't account for what's under it. Um, take samples from several locations, <coughs> mix them up, send them in. Should you collect manure from animals on pastures? Uh, no, but if it's going to be collected and utilized in order to go out and scrape it, then that's when it's got to be sampled. Um, many uh, commercial labs test manure. Most ag labs test, test manure. If you're in Delaware, they've got the Department of Ag uh, manure testing lab. Uh, analysis is uh, for total elemental content. Unlike with soil, we are doing a total digest. So we're using very strong chemicals. Typically now assisted with either uh, a lot of heat, like in a hot block digester or in a microwave, just a typical microwave, to break it down, completely dissolve everything, and they do a total elemental analysis. Uh, for nitrogen, it's a little bit different. Um, they're going to give you, you, you don't want to request that you get inorganic nitrogen, and they'll test for ammonia in because that's the uh, biggest inorganic form. They typically don't do nitrate. Uh, but for biosolids, you should request nitrate. So the typical manure analysis is just ammonia in, ammonium N, um, but for biosolids, you're going to want that nitrate portion as well. I mean, there is some nitrate in, uh, other, in say, chicken manure, but uh, it's usually considered nominal. Um, plant tissue sampling, uh, again, it's like manures where they're doing total elemental content of that tissue. And most commercial labs, it's, it's actually the same methods, typically very similar method. And it's used for mining crop nutritional status. A lot of people use this in season to identify a problem or to guide side dress and things like that. Uh, I've had a lot of questions actually this year I never had before about comparing PSNT to tissue samples where people have come to with tissue samples that said <clears throat> you don't need any nitrogen and PSNT says you need your full side dress rate of nitrogen and again my first question is what um, we took the sample how is the sample taken do you have confidence in the sample both tissue and soil uh, and generally when I have that comparison I actually usually uh, depends on the situation. I mean, but in this situation, I thought it was pretty clear, clear to go with the PSNT, just because there's more data on it. I think the tissue analysis uh, sometimes hasn't been, uh, those critical levels aren't as accurate, because there's a lot that can affect that tissue concentration, like a pest problem or something like that can affect that uptake. And so the question is, what's in the soil? What's available? But it's often used for diagnosing a problem. Um, a little bit about block, because a lot of this happens in orchards. Uh, it consists of the plains of the same age, species, and variety. has the same or similar soil type, so it's just like a management unit with soils, and can be managed as one unit. A block is best determined by the orchard manager who would have all this information. Uh, so here's a, a visual uh, you know, interpretation. So you've got different types of apples, and the blocks would be broken down by soil type and uh, the management. Okay. Plant tissue. Know the source of your interpretive data, so sample the correct part of the plant. For example, if you're looking at sulfur deficiency in corn. So that's one example where I think a tissue test is more valuable than a soil test, is for sulfur deficiency. Does anyone know where you collect a sample from in corn for sulfur deficiency, identify sulfur deficiency? Any idea? Okay. Under 12 inches height, you take the whole corn plant. Over 12 inches, you take the top fully collared leaf off of the plant. Okay, so very different situation. So you've got to know that because if you use uh, interpretive data, if you use recommendations based on one time or the other, and you didn't have the right tissue sample, you're going to have a very different uh, tissue analysis, a very different uh, result. So you've got to know the requirements and the constraints of the test that you're using. Um, Here's some examples from some fruit crops. Uh, you know, the time to sample, uh, first week of harvest, number of samples for plant part, 40 leaves, attach the petiole, and you take it from the current season's growth. Um, so it's different for every species if you deal with a lot of fruits and vegetables, which I don't. Um, but there's a lot of information out there that you can look up. Again, it's the same as soil sampling where you do random sampling. And it's often used for troubleshooting, as I said. And you, it's just like with soil sampling. You need to have a sample from the healthy and the deficient area. And this is where plant samples are probably more valid because you can get a, a, a quicker answer more rapidly between those two things. And if you see something, uh, you can see something much clearer uh, with troubleshooting with a, with a tissue sample than you can a soil sample. Um, people do uh, sap analysis. 
Uh, but again, that can be uh, constrained by the time of day because the plant is locating that sap depending on uh, the weather conditions. Um, and the chemical analysis of the plant, again, is total elemental content, just like with manure. Uh, and then there's usually a critical nutrient range that's recommended. And, you know, uh, it, there's an assumption here that the plant integrates all the soil, weather, and environmental factors. But one thing you got is that other pressures can affect that nutrient concentration. And that's why, like with this PSNT, I usually lean towards the PSNT versus that plant uh, nitrogen content. Although the plant nitrogen content, some of the things like an interleaf sample, if you're fertigating, can be very valuable. I, I have a lot of confidence in that. Um, diagnosis recommendation integrate system drift. Uh, so this is one philosophy for plant nutrient recommendations. Um, it balances the nutrients within the plant. It's critical for attaining maximum performance. It requires a multi-element analysis because it's looking at one element versus another. And it requires a lot of field calibration, which may not be available everywhere. Um, and so there's databases, but they're not available for, for uh, you know, everywhere. But you, you need to find it for your crop and for your, your location. Um, practical applications. Maryland state law requires that you have a soil test and organic waste analysis data. Um, you know, efficient farm management. If you're over applying, you know, this, this test, this recommendation is the base of your application. And the last slide I showed in my last talk, uh, fertilizers rapidly passing all the costs on farm. So it makes sense to have a good, good basis for your recommendation. And then again, it minimizes the environmental impacts of, um, you know, waste disposal, especially with manure and so forth. Um, with that, I think that's where I'm going to stop, actually. Um, are there any questions?